Hello everyone and welcome to Writer's Book Club podcast for, where are we? Oh, May 2023. I can't believe how fast this year is going. If you're a writer who loves nothing more than to dive deep into writing craft and process, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Michelle Baraclough, and today I'm delighted to bring you a very accomplished author, the fabulous Amanda Hampson. We are diving into her seventh novel, The Tea Ladies, which is classified as a crozy crime novel. I said that a little bit like Prue or Trude, crozy crime, cozy crime novel, but typical of Amanda's stories. It has a really strong, really beautiful narrative running through it, focused on her main character, tea lady Hazel. I do think the best crime novels, cosy or otherwise, are those that have a really engaging main character, someone who's not a cliche either. And Amanda, I think, nails it with Hazel Bates. We covered quite a lot about Amanda's process with the tea ladies. She talks about the importance of making the novel the best experience possible for the reader. She's very reader centric in in the way she writes. Um, How a comment in Facebook provided the initial inspiration for this novel. Why she displays her index cards inside the pantry door. (laughs) How she handled the three different plot lines of the novel. And also we touched on the challenges of writing the second novel in a series. So she has just completed the sequel to The Tea Ladies and that is off with her publisher now. So, you know, I had a lot of questions around that because how much backstory do you put in and where and yeah, so many questions. She also reads through some of the structural notes from her editor, which was super useful and such a good insight into the editorial process. So let me tell you a little bit about the tea ladies. This is from the back cover. It is a wickedly witty, cozy crime novel set in Sydney in the swinging 60s, ideal for fans of Richard Osman and Bonnie Garmus. Sydney, 1965. After a chance encounter with a stranger, tea ladies Hazel, Betty and Irene become accidental sleuths, stumbling into a world of ruthless crooks and racketeers in search of a young woman believed to be in danger. In the meantime, Hazel's job at Empire Fashionware is in jeopardy. The firm has turned out the same frocks and blouses for the past 20 years, and when the mini skirt bursts onto the scene, it rocks the rag trade to its foundations. War breaks out between departments and it falls to Hazel, the quiet diplomat, to broker peace and save the firm. When there is a murder in the building, the tea ladies draw on their wider network and put themselves in danger as they piece together clues that connect the murder to a nearby arson and a kidnapping. But if there's one thing tea ladies can handle, it's hot water. And whoever came up with the last line of that blurb, bravo, that is an excellent bit of punning. So let me tell you now a little bit about Amanda Hampson. She grew up on a dairy farm in the back blocks of Aotearoa, New Zealand, to a mother who had a love of literature and classical music, and a father from Liverpool who was, like many northerners, a natural storyteller. After being inspired by an English teacher, she fell even more in love with the written word and has gone on to write two non-fiction books, numerous articles and seven fabulous novels with Penguin, and an eighth, as I mentioned, already written and being edited for next year. Amanda has had, honestly, the most interesting journey from a life-altering event as a young woman, which she touches on in our chat, to a life of travel and learning and just immersing herself in literature and culture and basically just story. Her website is really well worth checking out as well, in particular her blog, which is kind of like a journal of her writing life for each book, um, particularly with the earlier books. All the research, and travel and notes accompanying each of her novels is in that blog. So it's well worth a read. And it's a, just a terrific insight into her process and just everything to do with her writing. I love her and I'm sure you will too. Please enjoy my chat with Amanda Hampson. Amanda Hampson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Michelle. It is my absolute pleasure. We've known each other for a while now, so this feels like a chat between mates and uh, we had an event together on Saturday. Yes, it was so much fun. Better Red Than Dead. I love that uh, the fact that you're just there and people are having beautiful cake and tea and not that we had much time for that. I did swipe a piece of chocolate cake as I was leaving, though. I know. I had a quick glass of champagne and a bit of lemon cake after the event. But uh, you had to dash off to the airport because you're on a very busy book tour at the moment. 
I am. Yes, that was a, a very hectic week in New South Wales, and now it's a bit more paced. I'm going to regional Victoria, and then I'm off to Queensland in a couple of weeks. Amanda, I've always loved your story, and I love reading your blog um, and your backstory. It's really inspirational for me. I'm I'm over fifty. You were fifty, I think. You were saying when you first started writing or really getting published. Got published, yeah, yeah. So before we dive into the tea ladies, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey to publication because for me, it's very inspiring, and I think it will be to a few of our listeners as well. Well, it is a little bit unusual because a quick snapshot over nearly 70 years, we'll fast forward. (laughs) I grew up in rural New Zealand, always wanted to be a writer, only I think partly because I loved books, partly because I had very little exposure to anything else. Nothing else happened. And going to the library was fantastic. And I wanted to not see my name on the spine of a book, but be able to give a reader the experience that I got from books. So I am a very reader-centric author. It's really all about keeping it simple, telling the story, getting the the reader immersed in the story. So I had thought that I would maybe become a cadet at the local paper. Maybe that was a way to become a writer. But when I was 16, I got pregnant and I was kicked out of home. So I was sort of homeless for about six months staying with different people who I found in the paper and I would look after their children and there used to be an ads then for unwed mothers and we were shuttled around like, you know, lost luggage. Oh my God, Amanda, what a star. Talk about character building. I know, but i tell you one thing I did in all that time I was reading. When I finally uh, was able to get a single mother's pension, it wasn't a single mother's pension, it was some other sort of pension that had just been introduced and it was about $13 a week, and I used to spend it on books. So it was just always been a passion of mine. It was my saviour. I gave my son up for adoption, and then that was pretty much my education finished in terms of formal education. Having said that, I was not a very good student. I was really only interested in English and history and geography. I must have been a bit disruptive because I can remember the maths teacher making me stand on my desk during maths lessons. Oh my gosh. So I just continued to read. I continued to learn. I am an autodidact. You know, once I get interested in something, there is absolutely no stopping me. So I went to London in my early 20s, and that was an incredible sort of creative renaissance for me. I had an uncle there, and um, he and a friend of his introduced me to everything. You know, I read Anthony Trollope and Jane Austen, and I read Middlemarch. I read just everything, all the 20th century and 19th century British, French. So that really opened up a new world for me. I continued to write in my work. I felt I wasn't ready to write a novel then. I didn't feel that enough had happened to me, surprisingly, because an awful (laughs) lot had happened to me. So probably in my early 40s, I wrote a nonfiction book, which was called Battles with the Baby Gods, which was about my struggles to conceive, which took five years. And I sent it to a publisher and they rang me up and said, we'd like to publish it. And it was funny because on the phone, I was like, oh, (laughs) great. And she was sort of trying to explain to me, this is unusual. Well, I know it's unusual, but I'm inclined to underreact. Anyway, so that was published and then I wrote another nonfiction book. And then I just had the feeling that my life was going to pass me by and I would not have written this novel. So I started working on the Olive Sisters and I worked on it for five years. And people would say, oh, you know, who are we going to send it to? I'm not even thinking about that. I just want this book to be as perfect as I can make it. So that would be my first tip is I think people are very keen to get something off to a publisher's for the reason of being validated. Yes, you're a fantastic writer. A lot of those books are really not finished. They're not polished. Now, once you're an established author, the publisher will encourage you to send books that are not polished because I do still tend to polish to the nth degree. But in the first instance, it has to be as good as a book in a bookshop 
That's just my opinion. But my opinion is borne out by the fact that when the book did go to Penguin, it was accepted straight away and published. So I didn't send it to any other publishers. And I've been with Penguin since 2005. The Olive Sisters is a beautiful book. Those characters, actually, I still think about them. So you're saying really get as polished as you can. And that was probably the fact that you did get it as polished as you possibly could helped you get published. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because it's a harsh reality is that the publisher is not going to read more than half a page if it's not well written. I mean, people say, well, that's not very fair. You know, there's, the second chapter is amazing, but why would you waste your time reading more than half a page? This is, this is poorly yeah. written. I mean, they've got a lot to read, you know, whoever reads these things. So, you know, between the Olive Sisters and the Tea Ladies, you know, the Olive Sisters was a dream run. You know, it became a bestseller. They were doing reprints, sold over 25,000 copies, happy days. In the meantime, I was working on another one for, called Two for the Road, which I thought was a really good book, but for whatever reason, the title, the cover, the premise did not appeal. And I had the very humbling experience probably three weeks after the book was published of going into a bookshop and seeing a pile of them kind of oh, kicked no, in the corner. Oh, Amanda. <laughs> when I go back to that bookshop, which I won't name, I look at that corner as if there was once a dead body in that corner. <laughs> I remember that corner. Never forget that like, corner. That book was something. There's still people that say Two for the Road is their favorite one, so it's <laughs> a different taste. So then I got very caught up for quite a few years. I was a single mother. I had two young children, a producer in the U.S., uh, optioned the Olive Sisters for a movie, and I wrote the screenplay and I went back and forth to the U.S. And so that was all very fun and exciting. But in the end of the day, that producer did not and could not find the money. I had the great honor of working with Fred Skepsy, who was the director on that, and learned a lot from him. So we used to Skype every few days, talk through the scenes. Amazing. Just amazing privilege. So end of that, I thought I've just got to write something much more appealing. So I wrote The French Perfumer. That went really well. Lots of people bought it, became a bestseller. And so I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we just, as authors, we just don't go from strength to strength. People say, what makes a bestseller? And I always say zeitgeist because, okay, I know there's a little bit of a science to it if you can look at it retrospectively, but in the mix, you have an idea, you execute it to a certain level. If the Olive Sisters was published now, it would not be a bestseller because people are completely over things to do with Italy. Even though that was set in Australia about an Italian family, that is no longer what people are excited about right now. But as it happens, nice segue here, cozy crime. (laughs) We're in the second uh, golden age of cozy crime. And so I just happened to have hit the spot and managed to sell 2,000 books in the first week. Yeah, and it's gone into reprint straight away. Yeah. Three days. Boom. I know. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. So what goes around comes around. Yes, that's right. Just on that though, Two for the Road wasn't historical fiction, was it? No. It, but French Perfumer was. Mm. So what do you say about publishers wanting you to stick in the lane that your first book, you know, if you start writing historical fiction, you should continue with historical fiction? Or do you think you should be allowed to branch out into other genres? Look, I don't want to sound overly pragmatic, but a book is a product. Mm. A publisher is a business. Mm. And look, I've been very lucky because I do not stay in my lane. It probably would have been better if I had, but I just get an idea. I know the ideas. It has to. It can come just from a sentence, but I know that idea will work. And I write it, and the publisher's been incredibly. They're sometimes they're a bit dismayed. So. Oh, okay. So this is not going to be set in France. Oh, it's not going to be set in Spain. Oh, but I have other redeeming features, let's say. You do, as well as seven novels under your belt now. So I feel like you've earned your stripes and they're just happy to publish and go with whatever you want to go with because you've proven to be a best-selling author. And not only that, but somebody who delivers a polished manuscript on time, your professional, that all goes towards being a publisher's dream author, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think 
you know, the fact that you're prepared to go out and publicize it, uh, the fact that you are across social media and, you know, doing all that work there. Mm -hmm. There is a lot to being an author these days that probably, you know, a lot of people would not necessarily want to sign up to. Mm. And it's probably changed even between the publication of The Olive Sisters to this novel, your seventh. That whole landscape of marketing and social media, et cetera, has changed even in that time. Oh, even since Lovebirds came out. Right. Which was changes every couple of years because uh, before that, Facebook was really where what I would want because Facebook is a boomer's platform mm. and, you know, I'm looking at a mostly boomer market. But as it transpires, the tea ladies is appealing to a much wider um, age group. And in the meantime, this wonderful group of women, the bookstagrammers, have manifested on Instagram. And so actually there's so much activity now on Instagram, which was never there before. That has become really book central. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, the tea ladies is hitting the zeitgeist of cozy crimes in the spirit of Richard Osman. Yes. And I think that comes very much from the fact that there is a lot of dark stirrings in the world right now. And people, you know, they want to escape. They want nostalgia. They want something that they can just lose themselves in. Uh, certainly there's plenty of people seem to want to read dystopian novels, but I'm certainly not one of them. <laughs> I just need to read The Guardian. <laughs> so crazy crime, I mean, that whole Richard Osman phenomenon, I mean, those books just went off and I feel like The Tea Ladies is right up there. So tell us about The Tea Ladies. Where did the idea or the ideas for The Tea Ladies come from and how did you know that these ideas were novel worthy? Well, so I'd seen this Facebook post of a tea lady with a trolley and a teapot and looking very mumsy in her wraparound penny. And so many affectionate messages saying how people love their tea ladies and, and all their names are wonderful, like Mildred and Hilda and whatnot. And then somebody had written, the tea lady knew where the bodies were buried. And it was just, that was just the moment I went, so she would. So I'm very interested in social history. I'm very interested in the class system, how people work together, how women were in the world at different times and the things that we believed and the things that were <laughs> imposed on us that we believed. And so I can, I don't know why, but I can just usually picture the, the scope of a novel from a single sentence like that. I can just see the potential right from there. So then Hazel Bates, my main character, to relax, does jigsaw puzzles. Now, I've never done a jigsaw puzzle in my life. And when I was writing The Tea Ladies, I tried to do one and found I was completely incompetent and ended up giving it away because I found it so frustrating. Jigsaw puzzles were absolutely huge back then. I mean, that's something that people would sit down and do in the evening. And I felt it was a, a nice time for her to be settled think and so then I've got one piece of the puzzle and that is the character and the type of character that gives me another piece which is going to be the era so it's going to be the 50s or 60s then what industry is she going to be working in so those two fit together perfectly oh the 60s happy days mini skirts all the things of my teens because I was born in 1954 so really from that time when I was 10 or 11, right through to the end of the 60s was all my teenage years. And, you know, so then those two pieces to get together. Okay, so what if she worked for a garment factory? Okay, what if she was in an area that's very interesting like Surrey Hills? Now, Surrey Hills is particularly interesting because there was a lot of crime there and that is partly because of the structure of that suburb. There's a lot of back lanes and anywhere, anywhere there's back alleys, there will be crime because there are hidden places for transactions, dark transactions. So then we're just putting that puzzle together and a couple of things. One is I understood the vibe of the 60s, the kind of excitement that women had at that time of the freedom of that fashion, the creativity, the wonderful people like Mary Quant and inspiring women starting businesses. It was amazing. 
Secondly, I had in my backpacking years worked in a clothing factory in Liverpool in England only for about a couple of months. I worked in the accounts office and we were referred to by the girls in the factory as the Queen Bees. Because you were not on the ground floor where the machinists yeah, and... That's right. Oh, we, were, we were a bit posh. A bit posh. So I could immediately see that I could put some building blocks there and then it was just really all research. And so I understood immediately that social fabric of the building is that if you were a factory girl, I don't know why they're always called girls, not women, you would never be going up to the top floor absolute hierarchy. So I guess I can picture how it would work. And then, then I get to work and start making notes and having ideas and, and, and researching physically. Like I went first to the Jewish Museum in Darlinghurst and talked to people there, told them, you know, tell, always tell people what I'm doing. I'm writing this novel. It's about this. And there was a woman there called Tinny and she uh, is the head librarian, I think. And so she gave me the names of some other people whose families were involved in Surrey Hills, in factories or making things for factories. And so then it just is, you know, goes out like a, you know, a wave where you're getting more and more information. Yeah. And when you're looking at the time period you're going to write about and the setting, is your ear tuned into moments where conflict might arise or opportunities to create tension. So, for example, with the 60s and the whole Jean Shrimpton episode where she rocked up to the Melbourne Cup in a miniskirt and scandalised all the matrons of the era, kind of lends itself to tension, a bit of conflict. To me, conflict is story. Mm. So there has to be conflict in every chapter. You will probably know who said this, but every character needs to want something. So I am always, I'm not applying that as a, you know, oh, what does this character want? But in the back of my mind, I'm constantly thinking, you know, what's this conversation about? I've got a very low boredom threshold. So when I read a book and people say, oh, Michelle, how are you? And, and Michelle goes, I'm great. How are you? I'm bored. I'm instantly bored. What? We don't need all this. They greeted each other. So... You know, that plays into me working very hard on the dialogue to miss out the boring bits. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm like that in life. And all my friends know that if we go to dinner and people start talking about boring stuff, A, their aches and pains, least favorite topic, getting onto topic and not getting off it, I will go, okay, change of subject. <laughs> and they go, oh, okay, right. I remember when we first met, I had originally done your website and we'd have a couple of phone conversations, but then we met at Joanna Nell's place for one of her book launches. And you and I just went straight into book talk and writing talk. Like there was no preamble, <laughs> just straight no, in. I don't do preambles. <laughs> it can be confronting though. I accept that. As listeners of this podcast will know, I'm an oversharer from way back. So your style suits me very, very well. So how did the process of writing The Tea Ladies roll out for you? Did it follow the same process as your other novels? Not really, because in all my other novels, I have maybe one or two twists, but this is a completely different genre and I completely respect that. I have read a lot. I mean, I'll read crime, like I think Candace Fox is amazing. I have read, um, well, obviously I've read the, the first Osman. And in fact, because I've written the um, second in the series, I then set myself a task of reading second in series oh. books so that I understand the challenges that I'm up against. You know, writing is creative, but it's also incredibly technical. So you need to look how are they handling things that happened in the first book. Anyway, so I started working on Scrivener, which I don't normally use. I, I just write, I'm seat of the pants. I start with something and then I move to something else based around the character. So it's very, very much character-based. And as we go on the tea ladies, I just need to put them sitting on the little wall that they sit on in the laneway and they start talking and I know how they're going to respond to various things. So I just keep, you know, putting various cats amongst various pigeons and see, you know, what happens. So I did it on Scrivener. How did you find Scrivener? How did you I found it quite easy and it's got lots of tools. But really, I think that I'm more comfortable with chaos. I'm very comfortable with uncertainty. So I then felt the need to have something more physical. So then I started to work with index cards. 
and I had these index cards all on the inside of the pantry. I go to get some, somebody come over, open the pantry, they go, whoa, what's that? <laughs> Uh, so they were literally from the top of the pantry to the bottom, all these different colored cards. So that as I was working on a chapter, I'd say, where does that need, when does this have to happen? Because there's three plots, one being Hazel's personal life and something very strange going on with her husband, Bob. One being what's happening at Empire Fashion Wear with the kind of crisis in the fashion industry. And one being the murder uh you know, the missing woman plot. Mm. So how much do I need to have of this and then interweave number two and add in a bit of number three so that we don't forget, you know, it's all about pacing. People are, yeah, pacing. People are sitting down to read a couple of chapters before they go to sleep. They're spending 20 minutes, half an hour on it. I need to keep that pace happening and 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 keep throwing in things that will keep everyone on track. When you read a chapter that's on two different time frames and the chapters are really, really long. Yes. And you might read one over four nights and then you flung back into the verse. You go, oh hang on. Now who was in this? What was this all about? <laughs> yeah, and I did love that. So there are 75 chapters and they're short, sharp chapters that keep you up to date with what's going on in all three of those storylines. What you just described is exactly me. 20 minutes lying down just before I go to sleep. It's great to be able to get three chapters of an Amanda Hampson novel. <laughs> yes, that's right. And then I'm updated on Hazel. I'm updated on the murder mystery and I'm updated on the fashion industry uh, plot line Ooh. as well. So that was quite a conscious decision as you were yes. really wanted because as you said, you're yeah. very reader focused. So you, you're all about keeping the reader engaged. So it was different to your other novels in that you used Scrivener. As someone that doesn't plot their novels from the beginning, is there a point at which some sort of planning needs to take place and that where the notes on the pantry door came in? Yeah, some sort of planning needs to take place. Look, I do a few different things that sort of keep me on track, but to some degree it is going by gut feeling. You know, at seven novels you do have a gut feeling. You do that very, very crappy first draft. You're wading around in words. It's just a mess. And then you get to the end and then the absolute joy in writing is revision. I could just revise till the cows come home. I just absolutely love it. So then you're going back and feeding everything that you came to the conclusion of back, weaving it over and over and then thinking, okay, well, at the end of the first chapter, if I had this person do this, then the reader would have a certain impression that I can then disabuse them of this impression later on, that type of thing you're pushing back. So I do a few different things. One is I do, I mean, I know your listeners can't see this, but I do this massive mind map of the characters. Can I take a screenshot of that so we can pop it on? People will see my very messy writing. Here we go. And so I start with Hazel's world, all the people in her world, because I'm inclined to write and put someone's name in and then in the next chapter go, what do I call that guy? What's that guy's name? And I need to, and I'm, I always write in individual chapters. So I don't write in a single document. So I would have had 72 documents at the end of that. Oh, wow. So Scrivener would have come in very handy for that then. Yeah, that's right. Then I copied and pasted that all into Word for my second draft. And I will remain for the first couple of drafts, two drafts, in individual documents, Word documents. The reason being that if you have one document, you will, every time you open it, you'll see something that needs correcting and you'll get stuck at the beginning. I mean, even with book two, I had to do a blurb for the publisher the other day. And the minute I opened that document, I started editing it. I just couldn't <laughs> stop myself. It was compulsive. So that keeps them all individual. When I feel, okay, these are okay, then the third draft is to copy and paste them into a single document. So that big page helps me work out, remember everybody's names, where they are, are and all this kind of stuff. Having said that, I also will give everybody a name in the first draft because I don't know how important they're going to be because I don't know what role they're going to play. That I, I might just decide further on, okay, I could get that guy, the guy that lives next door, he could do this. So consequently, I've got my um, notes from the publisher here. Consequently, I ended up with 59 characters. So one of the notes is, 
there's an awful lot of named characters. So one of the jobs was to just take away a lot of people's names and just uh, say who they were. So that was different. The other thing I do is I do a calendar and I say, because both books take place over a short period of time, three months, and it's they sort of go day to day. So I have to know how much time elapsed between this happening and that happening, particularly as women of that era, not to say women now don't, but women of that era would have lived lives of great routine. So they meet at the Hollywood Hotel as their watering hole. They would have always met on the same night. And she goes to work Monday to Friday. Different things happen on different days. So I have to make sure I don't get discombobulated and have something happen on a day that the reader's going to say, hang on a minute, it's not Tuesday. Because dinner was on the table always at a certain time as well, but when yes, Bob came exactly. home from work, so yeah, yeah nothing could yeah. happen then. Exactly. So I basically write on a calendar. I sort of scribble on that calendar page so that it becomes those three months in 1965 with those dates, and then I write what happens on each day so that I don't get myself confused. So I fill a book you know, just full of notes. I do a timeline as a spreadsheet so I know things that were happening in the world at that time, which are very important. I'm always using historical things. I've got here a list of biscuits. Oh, very uh, important for a tea lady yes. to know what biscuits I, they yes, were. Yes, well, that's right. I thought, well, what biscuits were around at the time? Tell us. I I sent an email to Arnott's and said, did they have a list of biscuits around in 1965? And they sent me a list. Fantastic. What was the popular yeah. biscuit of the day? Well, Tim Tams were around then, which people didn't realise. But there were there's ginger nuts, ice fovos, milk arrowroot, shortbread, calypso creams, uh, scotch fingers, Monty's. A lot of the ones that we still have in the uh, Arnott cream assorted. Exactly. Classics. And you have the good biscuits, right? The good biscuits go to the upper echelons, to the management. The upstairs biscuits the upstairs. and the downstairs biscuits, <laughs> yes. Where does the scotch finger fall? Is that a downstairs biscuit? Yeah, it could be a downstairs biscuit. Mm. It's a little bit luxurious because it's got that nice buttery flavour, but that is the managing director's favourite. So Mr. the older Mr. Carp, he has a scotch finger, and I think that that shows him as a sort of a solid player. He always has a scotch finger. He doesn't go like his son, Frankie, who was a bit of a, you know, despot. He is an ice vovo man. And, of course, always licking the fondant off before he eats it. Now, see, I think that really shows us a particular sort of person that does that. I think the biscuits are a marvellous tool for the show don't tell rule, aren't Ooh. they? Because he is a bit of a despot. He's hedonistic and, you know, completely egocentric. And so licking the... Icing off the ice burger. Tells, tells you everything you need to know. Tells you everything you need to know. He's a toddler in a man's body. Yes. So let me get this straight. So you did your first draft in Scrivener in the 75 mm -hmm. different documents and mm -hmm. then put it all together into two Word documents. So what were those two? You were working off two. Um, so, okay, so that Scrivener, we've got the rough draft there. Yeah. Then I copy and paste each of those 72 into a separate Word document. And then I work within those. And then the third version is the single document. Ah, the single document. So we're got three you. versions. Got yeah. you. Okay. So, Amanda, this is a new genre for you, and we've talked about that, the cosy crime. What new writing techniques did you have to learn for this novel? Well, I suppose what might be a little bit different, and, and right. I think Richard Osman has struck on this, and this is something that came naturally to me, is for it to be very, very character-based. So it's not like you get to the end of the tea ladies and go, that was an interesting crime, you know, or I can't wait to see what the next crime is because the crime is just one of the elements. Uh, it's really about their lives, their relationships, their conversations. So I wanted to bring people into a whole community as opposed to getting too hooked up on the whole crime thing. Speaking of characters, I think writing character is one of your superpowers. And in this novel, we have four tea ladies, each of whom has her very own distinct personality. How did you go about developing each character and making them so distinct? Because it could have been easy for four tea ladies in the 1960s to come across as quite homogenous. So tell us about how you developed each of those tea ladies. Well, I suppose to step back a little bit, I love meeting characters in everyday life. Uh, you know, when somebody comes up, well, I had a woman the other day 
sprint onto the tram, jump onto the tram. And she was like quite skinny and had her hair dyed orange. And I said to her, oh, well done. So she started talking to me and she had no teeth at all. And and I was just thinking, this is fantastic. I love this woman. And then she got frustrated because I could And she said, you're not coming around here, are you? And she stormed off down the other end of the tram. So I suppose I'm attracted to larger than life characters. And so with the tea ladies, I wanted them to be in contrast with each other. So I wanted Hazel to be a very sensible, lovable, calm person, the person that we all (laughs) secretly aspire to be. She's never frazzled. She's never phased by anything. She just thinks, okay, how do we handle this? What's, what's the solution here? I could imagine that Betty brings a level of emotion. So in some ways, she's a little bit a part of Hazel because she is the, all of the fizz and bubble and excitement that Hazel doesn't show. And she adores Hazel and she admires Hazel. So we have, um, first Hazel's third person voice. Everybody's in third person voice. But uh, it's intimate third person. So we, we know that Betty admires everything Hazel does. She's just in a complete thrall and she adores Hazel. So that gave her a d- completely different personalities. And, and you could then see that, that her adoration of Hazel and agreeing with everything Hazel says could be irritating for the other two tea ladies. Now, Irene Turnbuckle is very much her own person. She's from the criminal side of the world, and her husband was a famous safe called Fred Tweezers Turnbuckle. And so her ideas are almost the opposite of Hazel's. Hazel's incredibly tolerant of her. So when there's a problem, she'll say, well, look, I know a bloke that does kneecapping. And because Betty, in her enthusiasm, says, oh, what sort of work does he do? She says, well, that's just a side issue. And Betty immediately ma- imagines that that might support his other work, like he might make crutches or um, wheelchairs, you know. So I can see their brains going off in completely different lines of thought. And then Merle is the best educated of them all because she was a school teacher. So she naturally sees herself as a little bit above the rest. And so she always takes a sort of slightly superior tone, which, of course, Irene loves to wind her up. And, um, you know, Betty is quietly exasperated. So once the characters were really sort of formed in that regard, it's really a matter of getting them in the room together, you know, and then I just see how they bounce off each other. And I don't want to sound, you know, high art, but they kind of develop themselves because you, you're throwing in the, the conflict and then let's just see what they've got to say about it. I think writers can learn so much from this novel in terms of differentiating the characters. The dialogue is brilliant. And this is a very funny novel, Amanda. Honestly, it had me laughing and giggling throughout, oh, good. especially in those interactions between the tea ladies. Could we read a section from the novel to show this, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So this is from uh, Betty's point of view, and they are having their little meeting that they meet at lunchtime and they sit on the the wall and they open their sandwiches and they bring a thermos and sometimes someone will bring a tin with a cake in it and they share the cake. Hazel hardly has time to say hello and sit down before Irene, puffing away on her awful pipe like an old sea captain, starts going on about her firm secretary having it off with the boss. Irene's a terrible gossip and a bit coarse sometimes. I haven't got hard evidence, Irene tells him, but there's these looks. Lingering interrupts Mal, making out she's an authority on this particular subject as well as everything else, or smouldering. There is a difference. Sort of goo-goo-wise, says Irene. Say if you got a new couch and couldn't stop thinking how beaut it looked in your lounge room. Now, Betty would be the last person to bring up the fact that Irene rents a room in a horrible old boarding house. The fact is she doesn't have a couch or a lounge room for that matter, so that seems a funny comment coming from her. I definitely call that lingering, confirms Merle. Smouldering would be if Steve McQueen was stretched out on it. Betty can't help giggle. Oh, you'd like that, Irene. Wouldn't say no to those baby blue eyes, Irene agrees, especially if he was in the nutty. 
Merle turns up a nose rather unhygienic on the furniture. Anyway, you wouldn't pick this girl as the type, continues Irene. She's a chubby little thing. Chubby people have affairs too, Betty tugs indignantly at her own dress to rearrange the rolls around her waist. They're called womanly curves, and also, Irene, that secretary is not chubby. She's got an hourglass figure. More than an hour in her glass, Irene bears her dentures in a fierce grin. That's Irene, always stirring things up. Betty refuses to give her the satisfaction of an argument, apart from to say, you could do with putting on a pound or two yourself, Irene, you're just skin and bone. You're not really chubby, Betty, Mel reassures her. You've just got a small head. Betty frowns. Is that a compliment or two insults? What she's saying, Betty, dear, is that you're perfectly proportioned, says Hazel, who has been silent until now. She only involves herself in these squabbles when they get too silly for words. Perfect. Also, Amanda, who does the audiobook? Because you could do it yourself, you know. You've got such a good... <laughs> I don't know how people do audiobooks. Zoe Caridis does it, oh, and it's right. amazing. Yes, It's like a radio play. The voices are incredible. I must do a bit of a promo for the audiobook because it's brilliant. Normally, I start to listen to an audiobook and think, oh, oh, why did I put a butt there? That was ridiculous. <laughs> and I can't. I just feel all. But when I started reading, uh, listening to it, I was just absolutely enthralled by the voices she brought to it. Oh, well, you do a pretty good job yourself. Oh, thank you. So... With your 75 chapters, did you sit down to write a chapter a day? Do you have a word count? Like what happens when you sit down to write a scene or a chapter, choosing where to start, how to end it? Tell us about that process. Well, I have a minimum of 500 words a day, that's seven days a week, because that gets you sitting down and doing it. Some days that is like some kind of torture. You'd like 498 and cannot think of Two other words in the English language to put on this page. <laughs> other days, with the second one, because the uh, characters were more formed, I had a couple of days, and this has never happened before in all these years, where I did a couple of thousand words in a day. Wow. Because it was just really flowing very well. I was in a scene that was that was going somewhere and, you know, things were happening on the page. I mean, I would be completely exhausted after that. So, yes, I laboriously, I have a diary there and every day I write down, you know, I can see it adding up. So you start, you know, with 500 and then, and I look back in the dates. It also helps me chart how long it took to get to this stage and because it all becomes, a, it's like having a terrible road accident. I can't remember any of the details at the end. So yes, every day I write down my word count so you can see you're progressing. Because with the second book, I moved to uh, from Sydney to Melbourne and went to Spain for a month in the middle of it all. Yes, and so, right. you know, I have to just stay on that word count. Did you write while you were away as well? Yeah. I'm not all the time. I might have, you know, slacked off a bit. But. Yeah. Well, if you're knocking out 2,000 word a day, that gives you three days off, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is that how it works? It's easy to let yourself off. That's like saying if I walk 20 kilometres on Tuesday, I don't need to walk for the rest of the week. <laughs> Are you someone that has to have their head in the game every day? Like you've got to touch those words in some way just to keep the momentum going? Absolutely. Because I think that particularly when you're going back in time, so you're going back to 1965 and you're immersing yourself in that world, if you didn't do it for a week, you'd come back and go, where are we? What's happening? Why are these people wearing these funny clothes? You know, you just it just somehow helps. And I find that if I'm staying on it, When I'm not doing it, conversations are coming into my head, ideas are coming to my head. It's just like the door is open and, you know, the tea ladies are coming on in. And so if you don't look at it for a long time, there's going to be unevenness. Mm. You can see that unevenness quite clearly. Like, why is this scene here? This scene does not progress anything. So what can I throw in there? that is going to make this scene continue the story. So everything needs to have a reason and a purpose to be there. So when you sit down to write a scene, do you have certain rules around what that scene must contain? No, I sit down and go, oh, what the hell? I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I've lost I've lost it. I'm kind of, I don't know how to do this. It's more like that. And then you write a sentence. Oh, look, I think the creative mind is incredibly mysterious and I think... Often it is a little bit like 
when you have an amazing dream and you wake up and you try to grasp onto that dream, it's like trying to embrace a cloud. It just, it's, it just disappears. Mm. So I just feel to some degree I have to trust in myself that I know how to do this. And I will say that to myself. I know how to do this. I know how to do this. And if I write something that makes me laugh, I just, it just makes my day. When I I'd, I'd go, oh, this is good. This is good. This is good. One of my favorite lines in the tea ladies is about Betty has a little bit of a flatulence problem that she goes to great lengths to, to kind of disguise. And they're in the Hollywood hotel and something exciting happens. And there's a little bit of a, you know, rocket action. And Irene, is, who's always ribbing her about it, says something like, she's got some rocket power there. Give her enough baked beans. I think Betty could be the first tea lady in space. And um, I'm like, okay, that's that really plays a lot for me, the fact that nobody ever thinks what you think they're going to think. Mm. That makes sense. Mm. So they just have very different views about things. So those things can only come in as a kind of creep into your consciousness. I don't think you can sit down and go, I'm going to write a funny scene in the Hollywood Hotel. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. Mm. It has to go from word to word. It's like if you go to a party and you say, I'm going to have interesting conversations with all of the people in this room and I'm just going to be so fascinating. That is just a recipe for disaster. Mm. Exactly. Tell me about the editing process for the tea ladies. So you love revision. How much did you have to get rid of in the subsequent edits after that first draft? Well, I don't really get rid of things Mm. because I come to the end of the first draft and I've probably only got about 75,000 words. Ah, so you have to add. I have to add. So I don't go and write 120,000 words. That's a waste of energy. Yes. So some scenes will be... You know, Hazel looks out the window, she sees a backyard. I just map in what she might be seeing in her backyard. And so when I've got to the end of the story, so we really want the story and the plot in there, what's important about her backyard? Well, really just explaining a little bit of what it looks like because people walk through it and she has a wash house out there. She would have had an outside dunny. They're not that important in the scheme of things in that first draft. So in the second or third draft, we'll know she has pots of geraniums and the flowering, but da da So all of that lovely embellishment comes in another draft. So that's why it's so fun, because you can go in and you can now look around. You've got, the, you've got that first draft and you can stop panicking. You've just had like months of nothing but panic. And now you can go in and look around and observe and see what, what you might see. And so that comes in the next draft. And what about the cosy crime element? You know, obviously certain things need to be resolved. And were you conscious of having to add red herrings in or twists? Yeah, definitely. And that would come in the revision. Look, one of the things about things with a twist and crime and everything else is you have a deal with the reader that you will show them everything they need to see. What I don't like are books where they deliberately hide something from you as if they can see it all playing out and they've deliberately hidden this one thing that you don't know. I feel as though that's cheating. Mm. It's more like I'm going to show you all these things and you're going to draw a conclusion, which I is a construct that I have imposed on it. But I'm not hiding anything from you. It's there in plain view. So I'm very conscious of that. So then when I know who done it, I'm going back and feeding all these little hints to also throw the reader a little bit off balance and put in little things that might make you think something different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I certainly didn't see some of the twists coming. So well done there because there's not just the twist in the mystery, there's a bit of a twist in Hazel's personal story as well. And I love the fact that it was really multi-layered, you know, it wasn't completely plot-driven. The character narratives were so intriguing as well. And I mean, character is what keeps you turning the page as, as much mm. as plot, isn't it? Yeah. For me, that's that's the case. Tell me a bit more about that second in series. I'm interested because I know a lot of writers do want to write series. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, should this be a standalone as well? Should somebody be able to pick this up and read it off its own bat? And therefore, do how much backstory do I need to include? How much of the first novel do I need to include? And how do I do that without kind of having an info dump or 
Were they the sort of questions that were going through your mind as well? Absolutely. And that's the first thing I asked the publisher, how do you want it? How, you know, and they said, we want to stand alone. So then I read a book that was a second series and the author, two thirds of the way through the book, did like a two or three par- paragraph squeeze of, let's say, uh, and so this character she would never get over the fact that um, her brother had died of suicide and this happened and that happened and that happened and that happened. I was like, oh, okay, well, I, I didn't see that coming. And this is from the first book. Right. So I thought, well, I'm not going to read that first book because oh. I already know these were obviously all the mysteries in the first book. So I read a few of that and I started to see, uh, for example, Anthony Horowitz has done some second in series. And so you really look at much, much more experienced authors to see how they handle that. So I realized two things. One is you need to give some background information, but to not be boring the, the reader of the first one, you need to give it in a different way. Right. You need to deliver it in a different way, coming from a different direction. What I've done in the second one is not to bring in any of the characters from the crime in the first one. That way I don't have to explain why they're there. That's smart. Okay, yeah. So it's the crime element is standalone, very much so. Yes, very much standalone. And there's a sort of a reference. Betty brings up, oh, you know, we've got involved with this, you know, dangerous criminals in the room. And Hazel says, no, Betty, we've been asked not to talk about that, remember? Oh, which is a lovely seed for people to then go back and pick up the yes, first book, right? right? Oh, exactly. smash. Okay. Well, we'll see how it works out. I haven't got the, it's gone to the publishers, but I haven't got their notes yet. I'm excited to read it. What was the most challenging thing about writing The Tea Ladies, Amanda? I think definitely interweaving those plots, you know, because it's, it was like doing three novels in one and having to go back and forth and thinking about the timing not and not knowing what would happen in each of those plots, you know, that really was just, you know, stretch my brain. I was burning neural pathways all over the place. <laughs> so that that was really hard because, and that's why I needed to go to the cards because I needed to be able to stand there and look at them and say, okay, this happens here. We can put that on hold because, of course, you can't have something dramatic happen in one chapter and then just switch over to another chapter in which, this is a, a weird explanation, in which that character was in the previous chapter, but nobody mentions this dramatic thing that happened. So you have to have a continuation, but you're also having to interweave other things. And sometimes you might have to put them on pause. You might have to have just a little conversation saying, yes, look, we're going to look into that. Let's talk about that later. And you can have a character say that. We're going to, let's talk about that later when we're alone. So you're really saying that to the reader. We're going to talk about this. Don't worry. I haven't forgotten you. So did the tea ladies, apart from being a new genre for you, did the tea ladies teach you anything new about the craft of writing, Amanda, after seven novels? Well, I think I'm just learning all the time, yeah. you know, and it's, look, there are some things that are just, uh, you know, normal parts of writing. It doesn't matter if you're writing an email or a book, you know, you wanting to condense everything, to not have any spare words. So I think that uh, that is just normal, but certainly it was a bit of a high wire act in terms of keeping all those things going. I don't know why, but it was much easier in the second book. But, you know, there's probably, there's still three plot lines, there's still three characters. This time it's um, Hazel, Betty and Irene. But I just, my brain was just more used to doing that, I guess. And of course, you know, I do have my publisher's notes here. So, um, you know, when you get the notes on one novel, you know, you learn a lot for the next novel. So I send the manuscript with my own notes to say, this needs to happen and that needs to happen. And I'm very keen on M dashes and N dashes and ellipsis and things like that. And so, you know, I go through and I I do a search on those and take out, I think I took out 120 or something like that. And so I'm very keen on those. So basically the publisher's notes are three pages 
and a couple of plot specific questions. Do we get enough resolution? Read Bob's behavior. Why did the bag of mail not come through as usual? Yeah, just a few questions that came up. Then there's sort of just overall things about Betty gets eight point of view chapters. Um, we learn quite early that she works in Farley Frocks. We don't see her at work and only briefly at home. We're sympathetic towards Betty, but we'd love to her to have a goal or sense of motivation of her own and to support her role's point of view. So it's more things like that. And when I just read this now, I thought, actually, I didn't adopt a lot of those things. But Did you then write a scene or expand out the scene where he does explain his motivations? Because I feel like yes, I did get right. that resolution. Yeah, okay. Yes. So I actually wrote a whole new chapter. Right, okay. Because, you know, the, the publisher's comments are spot on. They're always spot on. They know what they're doing. So um, they might say, "You could you do this, that, and the other? I don't take on, I don't necessarily do that, but I take on the essence of what they're saying. I look at what the problem is and then I come up with a solution. Yeah. And we do get a bit more of Betty, don't we? We get a bit more of her home life. Yeah. yeah I think I added another chapter in early in the book. Right. Just delving into her home life. So we found ourselves getting a bit overwhelmed with a number of secondary characters especially as the plot becomes more complicated in the second half. I've attached a list of all the characters. Well, I had already done that. She said, I know you've done all of that already, but, you know, we might as well include it. Some of the smaller characters can be cut or merged to streamline things. So that's the sort of thing that you get back from. Super helpful. Yeah, three pages of notes. That's pretty good. I know authors who get a lot more than that, Amanda. Well, we don't know what other authors get. We're, we're just working in isolation, working in a vacuum. Here. Yeah, oh. Listen to this podcast and they'll tell you. (laughs) I do need to ask you a question that's been niggling at me throughout this conversation, and that is why the cards are in the pantry. Well, I'm living in Melbourne in an even smaller flat now, but at that time I was living in a flat and there wasn't really a door or a wall that had enough space for me to put all these things. So they did start out on the bathroom door. And then I thought, oh, no, they'd be much easier on the pantry door because I can just open it and I can just see them all then and then I don't have to look at it all the time. It's very easy to become just completely obsessed with it. For a minute there, I thought it might have something to do with needing to go for snack. (laughs) Another Tim Tam. Another Tim Tam. And also, I don't like people coming in to my flat and starting to read my cards. Yes, right. And they start, so what's this? Shut up. Leave me alone. wait and read the book. Yeah. 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 It's like somebody poking around in your brain. Yeah, that's right. Amanda, thank you so much for talking to me today. Do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with the listeners about writing? Well, I think, you know, if you're an aspiring author, I think it's really important to read. I know people say this all the time, read, read in your genre, you know, do bits and pieces of courses. You don't necessarily need a PhD. You know, you don't necessarily need to even go to university. If you are really passionate about it and you read widely and you think about what you're reading, you are absorbing that all the time. And the fact is that you need to be incredibly persistent. You need to just go on and on. Tenacity is everything. And that tenacity comes from realizing that there's a job to do. There's no point in saying to yourself, oh, I'm hopeless at this. Or, you know, oh, this is not working. I can't do this. You just soldiering on day after day and you know you get to the end and you might be imagining that you'll get a publisher it'll be fabulous and then you'll be have this fabulous cover and be on the shelf and people will be traveling across the country to kiss the hem of your gown but it's not like that at all there's just more and more work after that because it's a job and so you need to do it because you really love writing and you really love giving the reader that experience. Which you do, obviously, because you're still doing it and you've just written book eight and I'm sure there are many more in your future because this is your full-time job. Yes, it is. So if people did want to come and kiss the hem of your gown, you've got some other events coming up, haven't you, in May? Yes, I do. I'm all over the place. I'm going to Geelong tonight and I'm going to Melton and I'm going to Gisborne and various other places that I've forgotten where they are. So because I'm new to Victoria, it's just very confusing. Where you know, Where is this place? And then I'm up to um, Brisbane. Fabulous. So if people want to catch you at an event in May, because this episode will go to air on the 1st of May 2023. They can catch your events on your socials, website. Yeah, on social media, on Facebook particularly, I'm letting people know. AmandaHampson.com and you can get to all her socials from there. 
Amanda, congratulations on the tea ladies. I can't wait to visit with Betty, Hazel and Irene again in 2024. And you and I will catch up at some stage soon. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much. There you go. Amanda Hampson. How good was that? I loved my chat with her. Dive into her backlist too. You really won't be disappointed. Amanda knows how to tell a story and all of her novels are terrific. You'll find links to Amanda's website and socials, as well as a link to buy the tea ladies in the show notes at writersbookclubpodcast.com or right here in your podcast app, whatever you're listening to. Next up on the podcast, we're turning to crime of a slightly darker nature. Okay. Imagine receiving a frantic call from your sister who has been attacked by an unknown assailant and is trapped in the boot of a moving car. The call cuts out and you never hear from her again. You put your life on hold to raise her two children for the next 12 years and you're living with the guilt of knowing that it should have been you trapped in that car instead of your sister. 12 years later, new evidence comes to light and your world is thrown into chaos. This is the premise for the latest novel by Ray Cairns called Dying to Know. It's a pacey page turner with a gripping plot and fabulous characters. I flew through this novel and I'm so looking forward to chatting with Ray about it later this month. I want to know so much about how she wrote this novel and I would love your questions too. Have you read Dying to Know? Are you planning to read it? If you love crime, if you love good characterization, if you love a pacey plot, go grab a copy. Then have a read and then send me your questions for Ray on all things crime writing. And I will ask your questions in the interview and give you a little shout out on the podcast. As always, I'm giving away a copy of the novel with thanks to the fabulous publisher HarperCollins. Entries are now open, so head over to Writers Book Club Podcast Instagram or Facebook to enter. I've also popped a link in the show notes to purchase a copy of Dying to Know. So you can either click on that link, it'll take you through to Ray's website and she has all the buy links on her website, or, you know, just go to your local bookshop and pick up a copy. Uh, It's everywhere at the moment. It's at the airport, it's in Big W, it's in your local bookshop, it's all over the place. And I'm seeing posters for it as well at the airport. Amazing. So that's about it for this month. As I mentioned before, you'll find all the show notes for the episode right here in the podcast app or on my website at writersbookclubpodcast.com. If you are in the app and you care to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, that would be amazing. But did you know you can also now leave a star rating on Spotify? So I think this is new. You just go to the show page on Spotify And under the show's artwork on the left, you'll see a follow button. So you can follow the show if you like, and that way you'll always get updates in your feed. And then there's a bit of a blurb. And then under that is a little star icon. And you just tap on that and then the number of stars that you want to give the show. Like everything, it's easy when you know how, right? I didn't know about it until another podcaster told me about it. So now I'm sharing that knowledge with you. I'm recording today's show on the beautiful unceded lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation, where I am lucky enough to live and work and just feeling a little chill in the air now that autumn is well and truly upon us. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for being such great supporters of the podcast. I will catch you next month. Until then, happy writing.